this is my story, and I am only been in business 10 years, but we have a great, long, four-generation family history. So I am thrilled to be able to offer this to you guys. So I am so curious how many people uh, recognize the brand. Raise your hand. Which I am blown away by, and I, over time I, I'm realizing this is something that more people know than I realize. Because it is a small brand, even though it's one of the most famous brands in the world. So we have an interesting story. My dad actually created the labels of my great-grandfather in the 90s. He came across this black and white image of Pappy smoking a cigar, which was his grandfather. And it, he thought it was the perfect opportunity to um, make it an ode to his grandfather and all that he had done over the course of his life and for the family business. He had come across this ultra-aged whiskey. And it was the perfect opportunity to um, honor him. So that was in the 90s, and, uh, but it all started back in 1935. This is my great-grandfather, Pappy Van Winkle. He started the Stitzel Weller Distillery. It's uh, in Chively, Kentucky, a few minutes outside of Louisville, which is our hometown. As you can see, he was a dapper man. He was a big personality. Uh, he was, at his time, the top of his industry. He was the famous name for the brand. Uh, some of his most famous brands were Old Fitzgerald, which is actually still around today. But unfortunately, he had to sell, well, he had died at the time. His son, my grandfather, had taken over the business and sold, had to sell because of the decline in the industry and um, a family situation with shareholders. So he was forced to sell in 1972. But this quote, we make fine bourbon at a profit if we can, at a loss if we must, but always fine bourbon, was his motto, and it was known even at the time, and it still is today. It's been the foundation for uh, every generation since, and it still drives our business today. And it um, actually was a plaque on the entry gate to his distillery. So as soon as you drove in, everyone who worked there and everyone who visited knew exactly what they were getting. So things got, <laughs> things were very different. I feel like I, my dad was so funny. He was sweet enough to send me some images of him in his era. And I said, Dad, could you send me some pictures of the bottling plant in the 80s or 90s? And what he sent me, guys, I should I, I almost added, but I didn't want to have too many slides. They were him in shorts and ratty t-shirts and tube socks and tennis shoes. And I'm glad there wasn't a cut on his head, but. Um, <laughs> The business, when they sold the company, my grandfather held back one label, which is the older Van Winkle 10-year 10 10 year label, which is still around today. And it's what my dad used to keep his foot in the door and restart the business. So the 80s and 90s, this was what I remember from, from being in the family business. And my dad literally did everything himself from this box truck actually came with the bottling plant that he bought, I think, in 1982 or 81. Uh, he would go and pick, down, pick up the barrels at the Rick House, dump the barrels, filter the whiskey, bottle the whiskey, and then sell the whiskey. So very different from his grandfather, but it was his, all he knew to do was to pick up the pieces and persevere through the years. Uh, this, was, <laughs> this was us at that time. I'm actually identical triplet, and we have a brother who's a year and a half older. So four little ones at home, and again, this is all we knew about our family business was that our dad went to Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, 45 minutes away, and just worked hard every day. And it was so fun for us on the weekends. We'd go to, go to work with him, and it was a, a playground. So there was this old, like ancient bottling line, and we would surf on the conveyor belt or slide down the box chute from the second story. And then, you know, honestly, one of my favorite memories is climbing up the two-story uh, stainless steel tank where my dad had dumped, where it collected all of the unfiltered whiskey, which, which, or the filtered whiskey, which had not been proofed. And we'd stick our, open up the cap and stick our head in. It would just clear out our nose and just those smells of <laughs> bourbon we appreciated from a very young age, um, <laughs> which, as you, if anyone who's been in, any, in a distillery or been in the process, it, it's a special, uh, 
special uh, memory and nostalgia. Uh, so yeah, this is all we knew. There was nothing famous at the time. What Pappy had done, and he was obviously well known in the top of his industry at the time, that was all in, the his in our history and we didn't even really talk about it because again, my dad was just putting his head down and working hard and that's all we knew about our family business growing up. This is my brother and father uh, around 2000, I think. My brother, as soon as he graduated college, went to work directly for my dad in the bourbon business. And at the time, it was really starting to take off again. My dad found success and had gotten to the top of his industry, similar to his grandfather. There's so many parallels between them. I think my dad's a lot more casual and uh, <laughs> not as dapper as you can see from the picture, but otherwise they're so similar in the sense of like, all they care about is making a quality product and they have one vision. And so this picture to me just represents that as my brother came in, again, my dad didn't have any forward thinking and was just in the here and now, which was great for creating a quality product, but as you'll see, it made for tricky things to, to come. Uh, but this definitely represents them making and selling a quality product, and that was their only vision. So jumping to a few years later, I love that this is the 10 year anniversary because Pappy and Company, which I started 10 years ago, so I like that we have the parallel with Tugboat that we're all in this together and we're building it in a similar, similar timeline. Uh, so we had come, a, come into a situation where our family now was at the top of its industry, and we had this famous brand, but there were no, uh, per, like there was no merchandise associated with this brand. And what, what brand doesn't have like a cool sweatshirt to wear, to represent that brand that you love? Well, we didn't have anything. This is actually a sweatshirt that my brother had produced, just for family and friends. Probably made twenty of them or something. Well. We'd been thinking about it, but we really, we all, the three of myself and my two sisters, we had our own job and we were do, doing other things. I was doing interior design. My, sis, my other sister had her own uh, personal assisting company and my other sister was also doing interior design. And then one day our sister Chanel said, oh my God, you all won't believe it. I sold my used old Rip Van Winkle sweatshirt for $50 on eBay. We're like, oh my God, that's, a, what? that's crazy. Like who would buy who, $50 for that? So in 2013, we got together, the three of us. We invested our own money, which was very little at the time, created a website, started in my sister Louise's basement in Louisville, Kentucky. She was pregnant with twins, having her uh, second and third child. Um, and we just started. We created a website. I think we launched with about five SKUs, which was all promotional products like this, and maybe I think it set a glassware and a couple hats and a koozie but we were filling that need for this merchandise that everyone was asking for and we knew that there was a market for. Well, within a few years, it turned into a lot more than promotional merchandise. All of a sudden we were making bourbon balls, which are chocolates that are Kentucky tradition and we were making hot sauce with pepper mash grown by, with peppers from our friend in Georgia and aging them, aging the mash in our retired barrels. And um, we created a cigar brand with barrel fermenting tobacco in our retired bourbon barrels. And we worked with a local woodworker in Louisville to create things out of our bourbon barrels. So all of a sudden we truly had this lifestyle brand that wasn't necessarily about the actual bourbon, but it was an inspiration from our heritage and our traditions and the things that we loved every day and wanted as a part of our lives or that we were inspired by, which for us, we were thrilled about. <laughs> we were like, this is a creative outlet and you know, the promotional things, we knew that it was filling a niche, but it wasn't really what we cared about. This, our heritage and our traditions and just our creative outlet was what, what really was driving us. So, the interesting thing, I'll never forget one day, my brother, I was talking to him, and at this point, we were kind of on our own paths, and the first seven years, it was just a constant push and pull through our, we were experiencing a high level of growth, and we didn't really just associate with the bourbon business and my brother and my dad, but yet we were so parallel and so connected. 
there was just one day my brother said, Carrie, we're not in the hot sauce business. We're in the bourbon business. I said, but Preston, that, I mean, it's okay because we're not, or, and, and then he goes, um, we can't dilute the brand with hot sauce. I said, Preston, we're not diluting the brand. We're enhancing the brand. And right there, it was like I kind of had a pit in my stomach because for me, I'm the part of the family. It's my name too. And all I could see that I was doing was enhancing our brand and using that heritage to create something special that was only going to add value to that larger family business. So we were very conflicted. And my dad was so wonderful and supportive. And so was my brother. But also, you could see that there was tension and there was just a lot to figure out. So this is how we've gotten to where we are. Uh, the first thing is we hired a business consultant. So before we could even do any real work, we knew we needed to obviously have some sort of level of governance. My dad had not even um, figured out a succession plan. He had not even thought further than the here and now. Like I mentioned, he just had one track. And I don't think he'd even understood the level of success that he'd come across and how much... Uh, he needed to protect that. He hadn't even gotten to that. And thankfully, this is where Tugboat came in for me. And this is such a huge uh, part of my story is that I think it was, I'd been a Tugboat member for about three years before we hired a business consultant. And through those three years, I had, you know, put a bug in the ear and talked to the family and given them a, a book from a member and you know shared inspiring stories and he was so receptive but it was still nothing was happening and so finally everyone got on board at least for hiring someone but we still had a lot of work to do so before we could even do any legitimate work and moving forward we had to get back to that level of trust and so it was also fun because before I even learned of Patrick Lencioni this vulnerability vulnerability based trust our business consultant brought that to us which was amazing so as a family with all the you know we had plenty of baggage we had dynamics we didn't communicate well at all so the first three months we literally spent getting back to that level of trust and even understanding each other's personality tra traits so we did personality assessments and learned how to communicate with each other before we could do anything else. And then the next thing we did was establish a shared purpose and core values. This is so huge because even though, even with Pappy and Company, we'd created our own, but that didn't relate necessarily, our family members hadn't bought into that. So no matter what, as a family and the members who wanna all be a part of this cohesion, you have to do it together. And so. We spent a lot of time coming up with our purpose and our shared core values together, and that was integrity, legacy, and, and um, excellence. Um, the third one was develop a brand guide for the family to work within, which was another huge one because we were roadblocked with Pappy and Company. We didn't know where we could go. We had all these ideas to get into this category or that, but you know we'd get the feedback and we weren't able to even collaborate, and so we hired more help. And we now, and we're, it's still a process, but we're, we have a brand guide and we have a framework to work within. So now everyone understands that hot sauce is okay. And, but if I want to get into tequila, which I, we dabble with the idea that we have, if we want to, this is how we do it. Or um, actually, this is an interesting story of, of late. A few months ago, my sister brought uh, an opportunity to the family meeting about another totally different industry. And I think she was nervous. She had this big presentation that she'd received. And we kind of all were thinking like, oh yeah, they're not gonna go for this. This is just too far over here. And we'd never done anything like this. And everybody in the family was excited and was like, wow, Chanel, thank you for bringing this. Like, this is awesome. And so all of a sudden we were able to think as a cohesive team where we usually have so many different, we might have the same value system, but to have that framework and to know that everyone's on board with this whole new idea, which before with this one tunnel vision of whiskey and that's all we do, and this was so separate, it was a really special 
uh, meeting and it just was like, God, a lot of this work, which is so hard, is really coming to fruition because we all, we have the playbook now and we know that this fits within it. So I know that this is a fun business and people are really excited to hear about this cool business that my family's a part of and I don't even realize it until I talk to people like you guys who are excited about hearing our story. But I wanna make sure that I can give you guys a takeaway of how you all can think about this in your own businesses. So create the space for innovation and new ventures. Collaboration and communication are key. I mean, we know that in our own companies, even with Pappy and Company, our culture is so important to us. And that means all having buy-in and you know, being able to work as a team and be able to give constructive feedback. And all those things are just as important with a family. And a lot of times we let that go and we just focus on it at work, but we need to bring that into those family dynamics. Um, bring in outside help, that's obvious. I mean, just same with business too. It's like I've learned my, my whole career in the last 10 years of growing this business. When, when I'm not good at something, that's when you know to hire. And same thing with family. You know, we, we need a family therapist, right? So that's truly what this business consultant is in a way of like a business therapist and keeping us that third party. Opportunity for the next generation to work with the family enterprise and bring untapped talents. I mean, for one, part of this whole process has been amazing because before the three of us did not feel like we had a voice even in the bourbon business. And now we've been building our own business for 10 years and we know we have value in our family's bourbon business, we all have that same passion for it, but we all have different talents. And so now that we have the opportunity to have that voice in this family communication has really been amazing. Um, and yeah, it just gives people a, an opportunity to do other things. Diversifies the family business. Obviously, that's a, that's a, a, a no-brainer. And I think for us to have been on one path with whiskey and to now know that you know, diversification is a, is a strategic advantage to a business. And then this is a, a cool one. It really re-solidifies the core business for the next generation of success where through doing all of this work, I know that our bourbon business is stronger than it's ever been. And I think our mission and what we know we need to do for the future is even more intact through all the process and bringing more family members in and creating that family enterprise of communication, collaboration, and cohesion, it just helps uh, with the business. Like I, my brother and dad, I think they were a little bit complacent in the future, like thinking like, oh, this is how it is now. We're top of our industry and we're good. This is the other big one. Let your core values be the foundation for your growth. Your value system goes beyond your core business. So let the, the roots, the way you were raised, your heritage, your culture, be the inspiration for innovation. I mean, technically, I am not obsessed with the bourbon business. I'm now completely appreciative and have a passion for our heritage and, the, and our legacy. And so let that, let that lead. Don't necessarily have to focus on that core business because we all have a lot to bring to the table. This picture of my dad with all the grandkids, there's so many different um, personalities and creative minds there, like, don't let that go to waste, you know, open it up for opportunity. Um, it's a competitive advantage to have a legitimate story, a foundation for business success. Again, it's life's, I mean, we have such a special, every one of your businesses has a legacy and that's special and it's what made you successful with your core business. So just use those same values and just reinvent them. So to me, that is what uh, an entrepreneur in a family business is, is taking what we know, what's worked, and just innovate and use them in a new way. Lastly, this one came just yesterday. I actually was, was done with my, with my speech and building it out, but I thought about my dad, and I couldn't help but add this to the last. Your leader has to have an open mind especially too for a lot of you first generation in business. If it weren't for what my dad has done for us in the last four years of this work, we would not be where we are. And the last thing he needed to do or wanted to do at almost age 75 when he'd gotten the top of, to, top of his career and he was in a position to sit back and just play lots of golf every day 
we are really busy and we're doing a lot of work with this and he's truly doing it for us in the next generation because he won't be here for it. And he, he never thought about the future and this was not where he thought he would be spending the last um, awesome years of his life. That sounds so uh, gruesome, but he, he's, he's healthy and happy in uh, 74. But uh, I just thank him so much for giving us that opportunity and being open-minded because he only cared about making great whiskey. And now the fact that we have this brand that he is supporting wholeheartedly and he's our number one fan, so he's 100% doing this for us in our future. So I thank him. And it's a lot of work. And one last thing I'll say is that this is an ongoing process, so everything looks like oh, we've got it figured out, and now we're on to the next phase. It's such a continuation of work, but it's just so worth it. So thank you. I appreciate you listening, and hopefully this can inspire you guys in your next uh, decade of, of business. Thank you. <laughs>